is right now, all over the country, workers are setting down their fear and standing together to stand in their power. They're writing a new future for our labor movement. But we also know that too often, the laws that are supposed to protect these courageous workers aren't doing enough when they really need them, and that leaves them subject to uh, rampant union busting, employer retaliation, other illegal tactics. So um, this afternoon, we'll hear from two courageous women who are fighting to build worker power despite the limits of our current labor laws. So to me, activists like these two are the real heroes of our labor movement, and we have so much to learn from them. So let's give a huge welcome to Grace Zopelis. Did I say it right? Zopelis, who is a barista and a Starbucks Workers United member at the Chevy Chase store, recently organized, and Natalie Duliba, who um, is a page designer but has been on strike from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette for more than a year. So thank you two both so much for taking the time to be here today and share your experiences. <laughs> And I just wanted to thank our sponsors, the Worker Power Coalition and the Workers' Rights Institute at Georgetown Law School. This event is part of Labor Spring, which is uh, part of the Kalmanovitz Initiative for Labor and the Working Poor. And all over the country uh, this spring, campus uh, activists will be shedding light on the real stories of workers and what they're facing. So um, I'm going to be passing the mic back and forth uh, for the sake of our recording. Um, so Grace. Um, what inspired to get you to get involved with organizing your coworkers? Um, so, hi, I'm Grace Opolis. I've been a partner for um, a year and a half at Starbucks, and I've been a union member since August of 23. Um, what inspired me was anger, to be honest with you. Um, I was quiet at my store for a really long time. We had a manager who was really equitable. We never had to fight for hours. We had a consistent schedule. Nobody was treated differently. Um, then she was fired. Um, our new manager was racist, to be honest with you. Um, he treated our black and Filipino workers. We had a lot of Filipino workers when I started. Um, he punished them um, more unfairly than his, um, than our white counterparts, um, such as myself. And there are not a lot of white people at my store. Um, so I was fed up. Um, my favorite supervisor was being threatened to be let go just because my manager didn't like her. Um, our hours were cut, our breaks were cut, um, and there was nothing else left to do. Um, so uh, there was one day that we had a 45 minute wait time for drinks and we're a fast food company. Our drinks are supposed to be turned out in less than 10 minutes. And after that day, it was really intense. I pulled my manager to the side and I said, this is completely unacceptable. What can you do about it? And he said, nothing. This is just a really busy store. Um, so I called the unions immediately. They reached out and I started organizing. <laughs> and so uh, when did you go public with your union support and how did your managers respond when they found out that you were helping organize? Um, so I let my manager know immediately um, that one day that we had the long wait time, he called me crying, saying that he thought that we were friends and he was really, <laughs> <laughs> he was really offended that I was angry about such a long wait time at the second busiest store in Washington, D.C. Um, so I immediately retorted to him while he was in tears on my walk home. Um, well, I just alerted Starbucks Workers United that we're an excellent candidate <laughs> for unionization. And um, he seemed taken aback. There was like five seconds of a pause on that phone call. And he just said as blankly as possible, I support a worker's right to unionize. And that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> so I'm hoping you can, uh, we've all watched the news from Starbucks and we know, you know, it doesn't necessarily end there. Can you tell me a little bit about some of the management tactics when in the weeks leading up to your union vote? Um, so at um, SBWU, we like to say that um, Starbucks employers use tears, fears, bribes, and smears. I already told you that we got a lot of tears from my last manager. Um, used a lot of rhetoric. Like, I thought we were friends. I thought we could be honest with each other. Do we need a third party getting involved at our store? Can't we just work this out together? Um, at Starbucks, they call people Starbucks partners. Um, whether you're the CEO of the company or um, a chair member or a barista, you're a partner. 
Um, so it's supposed to level the playing field. We all know that that's not true. Um, there was increased surveillance at my store. Um, they called union busters to fly in from all over the country just to tell us that, you know, if Disney World was a Starbucks benefit, a union store wouldn't get that. Um, <laughs> I um, attend Arizona State through um, Starbucks's college achievement plan, which means that I get free tuition. And it's the reason why I started out as a barista. Um, I went to American University for two years, but as you all know, private school is incredibly expensive, and I've got a little sister to worry about. She's currently in college and has two years left to go, and my family couldn't afford um, to send her through college um, unless I had a free ride. So I came here for this college benefit, and I had a union buster look at me square in the face and say, you won't get to go to college anymore if you win your election. Um, so they're not just threatening me with my job or with my dress code or silly little Disney World benefits. Um, they're threatening my education as well. Um, so, but management did not win. You all won your vote in August, which is amazing. How is bargaining going? So as you all know, um, Starbucks is one of the biggest union busters in the history of the labor rights movement. Um, so bargaining has been very slow. Um, we have not had our first bargaining session because um, Starbucks refuses to bargain in good faith. Um, we originally wanted some SEIU members and SBWU members on Zoom calls while we were at our bargaining sessions just to hold them accountable and because I've never organized a store before until I had to. Um, I've never been a union member until I needed it. Um, and, you know, we just need help um, on the bargaining table because I've never been on the bargaining table. Um, they refused to do that. Um, our store originally had a renovation set for next month. And since we called for a collective bargaining session just to make sure that um, every employee had a temporary store to go to for four weeks, that everybody would get paid during that time and that nobody would be laid off. Um, they didn't like that at all. Um, so we don't have uh, renovations until over the summer and it might be pushed again um, when corporate refuses to bargain. So we'll keep on fighting, we'll keep pushing through. Um, the store remodel is supposed to make the store more efficient and make more money. So hopefully corporate sees that at the end of the day, we would be bigger money ma makers if they just bargained with us. So Natalie, what made you join this strike at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette? Um, so I, I joined, I moved to Pittsburgh and I got, uh, started my employment at the Post-Gazette, um, in January of 2020. And, uh, as a page designer, copy editor, I have like nighttime, um, shifts. And so I was not involved with the union because, uh, all the union stuff was during the day. Um, and I didn't want to give up like what precious personal time I had since I was giving up like nightlife, socialization, um, and, what really happened is we had like a, this really long Zoom call where our local leadership said, "We're going out on strike, guys." Uh, like th we we held a vote, but it we were going out on strike because we had four sister unions who already who were already striking. Um, <laughs> like we talk about the Zoom call like it was like a like a battle, um, and I w was waiting for us to speak, and uh, one of the other. Uh, people he kept on speaking over people even though he had had his a lot of time like several times and I just kind of <laughs> was sick of it and I shouted him down um in order to be able to express what I want to express and it was like this one moment uh that like changed my whole union trajectory like went from like for those of you who are familiar with like the kind of like scale of like one to five like I was like a two um <laughs> and like kind of like blase about stuff and I don't, there wasn't like any like a part of me that was like considering not going in I think it really helped that um like the stewards and people who had reached out to me were all on the copy desk um a lot of people the few people that I did know because a lot of people who went on strike were just names on a page for me for almost three years but the people who I did know were all going out on strike and it was just like never occurred to me to scab um and the local leadership, they said, hey, you were really great in that Zoom call. Um, do you want to head a committee? And I said yes. And then I joined like two other committees. Um, and now I'm the local secretary for our unit. Um, or I guess for our local. <laughs> 
so it's just like kind of like one like one moment of just not wanting <laughs> just wanting to be able to speak um and i i was there you know the the truly the next day like 24 hours later um it was cold and it hailed that week um and there was never there's never been a time when i was like thinking about going in um i know we had some people who were out on strike who who have gone back to the office and hid behind reasons um but uh I I'm glad that I did the people that I'm on strike with are some of the best journalists the best people um, and you know now I'm fully committed <laughs> so you guys um, have had a tough fight you've been out for more than a year and it was in January of 2023 that the blocks were ordered to bargain in good faith um, what what impact did that have on on on, on management? D did it bring them to the table? So the in January 2023, an administrative law judge uh, issued like a 50-page smackdown against the Post Gazette for their years of bad faith bargaining practices. Um, it was it was the week of our like we had a hundred day rally planned and it happened just a couple days before the rally was meant to happen and it actually was <laughs> and it was in january so it was a really big pick me up in terms of morale um and a way to be like say you know, you know we are right we're not just like shouting into your void we're not trying to be like you know people can be like oh you're being too what a, you're being too uh, idealistic it's like no here's this this it's not like a, it wasn't a weak ruling. It was very thorough. It was uh, supporting everything we had been saying since 2017 when our last contract expired, since 2020 when the company imposed conditions that that ruling was um, for, for the unfair labor practice lawsuit. Um, but unfortunately, it hasn't had a lot of uh, practical effects because the company just appealed. And they said they'll appeal as long as they need to in order for, you know, for to be right for them to win. Uh, the appeal hearing hasn't been scheduled. It's been over a year now. Um, it's because, you know, the NRLB is notoriously underfunded, understaffed. Um, our, like, sector representa representative, she's been very supportive of our efforts and um, alternative ways we've tried to enforce the ruling, but... It's just like a big waiting game, and the company doesn't care. They don't care that every day that they don't abide by the the, the ruling is more money they're going to owe us um, in back pay, in um, health care costs that they should have been covering this whole time um, because this is a company run by, like, several generations of inherited wealth, um, and it's easy for them to just sick their ante union union busting law firm on us and have him waste our time and our effort um, than it is I guess for them to just come to the bargaining table with us in a way that is not wasting our time that is not insulting to us um, so <laughs> it's nice to have it on our side but in terms of actual effect on ending the strike it there's just no teeth to it. The company can just appeal and just go on as business as usual, which is deeply disappointing. And whatever <laughs> good feelings people may have had about the Post Gazette or the owners or like our executive editor has really vanished, has just evaporated because we know that <laughs> Like we've done our our job on figuring out who's on the board of the directors and reading, like reaching out to them and reading up on like <laughs> the incorporation of the company to see wh who we can put pressure points on. We're still doing that. It's not like a fight that's over that we've given up on. But the fact that we have to resort to knocking on our publisher's door to hopefully see if he has actually if he has any knowledge of anything that we've brought to the bargaining table that the the ruling requires them to do is just so frustrating <laughs> so that that leads into a question that's really for both of you um you know you you hear a common theme here and you know employers not bargaining in good faith how h how could the law better protect workers like you um in this instance um yeah i'd like to piggyback off of the sentiment that 
um, the National Labor Relations Board doesn't have enough power at the moment in order to make a positive impact in the workplace. Um, at my store, um, we've tried to file um, unfair labor practices, and after months of fighting and fighting and corporate appealing, really the only segment of accountability that we do get is our employers walking into the room, reading off a sheet of all of the unfair labor practices they've committed, and basically apologizing. Just saying, this is what we did, I'm sorry we did it, and then it's business as usual. Um, there's such a high turnover rate at my store that by the time these UOPs are filed and that we win, the staff won't even know why we unionized. The staff won't be there. Um, I've survived uh, my first firing wave last February, and this February, my manager told me that we're about to get a core team of employees, which means that at least five baristas are going to be fired this spring. Um, they're just going to keep on letting us go until we don't even remember why we started fighting in the first place. Um, so we need to hold Starbucks financially accountable. Um, we need to remind them that their employees are not expendable, um, that we can't be replaced, that we have value. Um, we need to find them for these unfair labor practices because money is the only reason um, why they would change their mind on these things. Um, we went on strike for one day um, on November 16th during the Red Cup Day campaign. Um, it was the first official Starbucks strike in Washington, D.C. Um, and they cared. When they saw their employees, including two of the best baristas on their floor and a supervisor who'd been in the company for over a decade, they started shaking a little bit. When they saw the president of SEIU outside of their door, they started shaking a little bit. Um, we lost thousands of dollars of revenue that day proudly, and we shut down the store six hours early. Um, <laughs> and um, to brag about the national campaign that day, Starbucks decided that there was a new rule that supervisors were allowed to turn off the mobile order app at our stores, which really helped staff um, calm down. Um, we got a lot of mobile orders. Mobile orders are more common than cafe orders. Um, so now supervisors have that new power because they lost a lot of money that day. So we just need to keep on finding them and holding accountable, um, holding them accountable that way, um, because that's the only way they'll listen. Uh, yeah, one hundred percent. It's like a money thing, um, and the fines that that do exist are are nominal and co corporations like Starbucks or even like a small family owned company like BCI that open that own, owns the Post Gazette can easily absorb them um or they just like say no and then it's like okay they just didn't and there's <laughs> there's no teeth to punish that either um and especially when you have these companies that have just, just like oodles of unfair labor practice lawsuits against them and they're still allowed to operate business as usual while the workers wait months for them to get on the docket, um, for the rulings to happen, workers who are fired, especially specifically for Starbucks workers who are fired, they don't get their jobs back for over a year. And even when the ruling's in their favor, it's still months before they're back in, if they even still want their jobs, because a lot of times the managers have been awful. Um, so for us, it's we're like a, a very well-established unit um, at the Post-Gazette. So to see the slow erosion of our union gains over the years because companies can just wait us out um, because they have the money to do so and it's our livelihood, like our publishers, the twins who own, <laughs> who own our thing, they, they don't need to ever earn another cent in the re for their lives, neither will their children. Um, they can just walk away if they wanted to and they'd be fine because of all the wealth they've already accumulated on our backs. Um, and a lot of times it's just like trying to hit the, the post set in, rep in their reputation, um, which is a lot of times it's just like optics, it's getting people to know that we're still on strike or that we are striking or um, organize around particularly terrible things that the management has done or that they've published. Um, and and get larger retailers that sell the Post Gazette to stop doing so, um, and to keep that commitment, um, so that it is the pocketbook that gets hit. But sometimes it's <laughs> the reputation for these 
um, rich men who buy papers in order to feel like they're a newspaper men, you know, back like in the day. Um, and it's, definitely for the blocks they get the feeling that they own this paper so they can like rub elbows with like you know new york elites um or like billionaires they get to pretend that they're like jeff bezos um and but when you have you know a paper you don't want it's hard to be like proud of a product when your town your city that it represents doesn't like it or, or thinks it needs to be better and is ashamed of the things that are published in the opinion page or the practices against its own workers. Um, we're fortunate that Pittsburgh is a very union town. Um, unions are a big part of the culture in Pittsburgh, um, and that we believe that like a union newspaper is what should be the type of newspaper that we have. Um, but it all comes down to that money. <laughs> so I, I know that all of us here in the room are committed to being in the fight to fix labor law to pass the PRO Act, to fund the NLRB so that workers like you two who are, you know, stepping up and building power um, can have more support. Um, that might take a minute for us to fix the labor law to be what it needs to be. In the meantime, um, and this is my last question, how can we all support you? And I'll, I'll give it to Natalie. Um, so I have brought <laughs> these pamphlets here. Um, this is information. I'm also on the front of it. Uh, and a lot of it is just like making sure that people know that we're still fighting, that we're still out here. Th so there's no excuse when the second gentleman, um, you know, gives a quote to a scab reporter or when our own governor retweets a scab story from a scab reporter. Um, those things aren't acceptable. We don't want to make sure we want to make sure that people call them out. And honestly, when we see people online kind of grassroots call out these things that's um a good because then more people will see that and also it's very heartening for us on the on the picket line it's uh we went out in october of 2022 um so those little victories are what keep us going um as as i said money talks we we are on the picket line um through the generosity of those who have helped us um there's a qr code here on this pamphlet um that will take you to the donation page um there's also some uh cool pins designed by our uh, striking designer um and we have an, a fabulous strike publication called the pittsburgh union progress where uh all the journalists uh who want to and um a lot of them do write fantastic stories about the things that Pittsburghers care about and they're doing it for free um, and we want people to know we want the Post Gazette and the managers and the editors there to know that like you want these reporters in your newsroom you want this caliber of reporting published in your paper and the way that we can emphasize that is for people to subscribe to that to read those stories to retweet those stories um, and to uh, really make sure that the everyone at the Post Gazette and the the, the BCI, the ownership, the, like the owner, the company that owns them, um, knows that this is people things that s people care about that they want um, to happen. They want the strike to end. We want these reporters and designers and editors back in the newsroom, doing what they obviously love because they're doing it on strike as well. Um, so that's like the very much you as a, a person can do really easily on your phone type of thing. Um, but in like a broader movement is pushing your, your senators and representatives to increase funding to the NRLB, to fight for bills that are pro-labor, um, to stop these roadblocks that we come across at every aspect of being on strike, getting unemployment, um, the first time for the second time, um, you know, holding companies accountable for their anti-worker stances, for them violating labor law, um, having, you know, stronger protections for workers. That's like a broad, you know, in the future type of stuff. But as we were talking about earlier today, it's like if, if we forget about it now or let something slip through the cracks now, then it'll be l a larger problem tomorrow, next year. Um, and people who are looking to exploit those uh, vulnerabilities will be able to do so if no one's looking. Um, so. Okay, I see a question. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, yeah, so although Starbucks Workers United has not called for a story boycott because, you know, most of us are baristas and customers give us our paycheck. Um, we have called for a gift card boycott in the holiday season and we continue to promote that gift card boycott. If you get a Starbucks gift card, tell your loved one why you refuse to accept this Starbucks gift card, um, that they don't support their workers, um, that they fund uh, the wrong people in the wrong places. Um, as far as um, my store as an individual store, um, tip your baristas. Tip them generously. The coffee's only $5. I hope you can afford a tip with that $5 latte. Um, you can order uh, Union Strong as your name. So I have an excuse to shout Union Strong in my store in front of my manager. Um, you may think that it's a little thing, but it is a big deal to just shout something about the union in the middle of my work day and then turn and look at my manager and go, what? It's their name. Like. <laughs> So um, there's also a no contract, no coffee pledge, which is on Starbucks Workers United's website just to show solidarity for your baristas. Um, there's also a newsletter on their website so you can sign up for when the next sip in will be happening in your location or when the next strike will be happening in your location. I hope to schedule a strike in the near future um, for my store again because the first strike was really successful. Um, so I'd love to see your faces on the picket line. So we have a big round of applause for our speakers. Thank you, Grace and Natalie, so much. You're amazing. Thank you for your courage and all you're doing to rebuild the labor movement. And we're there with you as long as it takes.